Hi. How's everyone doing? Great. Hi. Uh, my name is Anthony Bishoprick. I am a staff software engineer at Square. And uh, welcome to MoneyCon. I guess I thought I was first. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'll be talking today about a service we built at Square called Books. Uh, if you want to talk to me afterwards, during, we're about to do a break after this slide deck, so feel free to talk to me. Also, in the back, raise your hands. Uh, Dennis and Peter, uh, they're also on the payments team at Square. Happy to talk about stuff uh, if you're interested. Um, so <laughs> I, we're going to be talking about double entry accounting, and, and you're probably like, why is the guy from the only payments processing company talking about something that has nothing to do with payments processing. It's like, what are you doing here? Um, double entry accounting is great. Uh, we're going to talk about how it's super, super useful for actually modeling financial state um, and kind of just how it powers Square in general. So starting with an analogy, uh, this quote, some nerd on the internet was like, yeah, uh, anybody who um, doesn't understand what the features that Lisp, the, the programming language, provides is doomed to reinvent it. Um, and this quote comes in the context of like uh, not understanding like the features that it has and complaining about programming languages, missing features, and then language developers building them into the language, and you realize that you've created a giant mess in the language, and there's too many features. So like C sharp is like a common. It was this example in this link. Um, engineers at, at companies like ours also tend to make this mistake. You know, we'll see uh, we our static code is too constraining, so maybe we want like data as code, maybe we want like a, I don't know, like a JSON DSL or some way you can like write a little expression language that you can save to your database and then run on demand or something. And then you create a big mess that way. You end up writing essentially this, running into this problem. So uh, to, uh, by analogy, accounting and, and double entry accounting specifically uh, is also something that and people who run financial systems end up reinventing as well. So. Uh, you're, I'm going to say it right now, you're doomed to reinvent double entry accounting if you don't understand what it is and at least understand the concepts in it. Um, so at Square, we had this problem. We invented a, you know, we had the core card processing platform, you know, the little readers. You plug in the phone, take card payments, and then they get settled. And so we had, like, a very basic model at first, and it got very complicated. And so uh, we ended up creating this unmaintainable mess eventually. And... <laughs> Uh, the kind of a spaghetti monster with, uh, within the settlement system. And so uh, what I want to do today is kind of talk about, one, in, at a high level, you know, what double entry accounting actually is, and like, do like a very lightweight introduction to it. Hopefully, you, know, you can't spend more than 15 minutes talking about accounting without people losing their minds anyway, so we'll be very quick. Um, and then we'll talk about the system that we built on, that uh, powers Square's double, usage of double entry accounting. All right, so this guy is Luca Pacioli. He's the first documented uh, author of double entry accounting terminology. He's like the father of accounting. Um, uh, not that accounting started with him. Uh, you know, there's like signs of double entry accounting on like cuneiform tablets. It's been around for a really long time. I actually have a quote. I hope I still have it pulled up. Yeah, okay, check this out. Um, so this is a quote from a history of the modern fact, problems of knowledge in the sciences of wealth and society. And they got really into it. I mean, this guy's a monk, and he invented double entry accounting. Uh, double entry bookkeeping helped confer cultural authority on numbers. It did so by means of the balance. For late 16th century readers, the balance conjured up both the scales of justice and the symmetry of God's world. So they were really into it. Um, uh, so it's very powerful. Um, Super quick example, this should be pretty straightforward. Um, in accounting, you have these things called accounts, which are basically named balances. Um, and uh, we've got two accounts here. One is called, how much do I have in inventory? And I just set it to zero to make it easy. Um, and then the second account, how much in cash do I have on hand? So here's one example of a transaction or a journal entry. I'm kind of going to use those terms interchangeably, um, where we uh, sold or got rid of $35 of inventory, and in exchange, we got $35 in cash. Um, the only rule, the only really important rule in double entry bookkeeping is that the left side matches the right side. Um, the left side is called debits and the right side is called credits, but literally just don't even worry about it. it you will not be able to make sense of what those words mean. Um, <laughs> the only important thing is that they match. So what's really interesting and what's going to be relevant later on when we talk about the implementation of books, the service that we built, um, 
is that accounting data, that, tra that transaction, is modelable as a graph. So here's that same payment uh, for uh, having exchanged inventory for cash, where instead of you know, those T charts, those kind of like crosses, instead it's two nodes. One node's the how much do I have in inventory node, and the other is the how much do I have in cash node. And we've drawn one edge, which is the $35 transaction. So draw that edge. Um, so just to take this like, terminology uh, and extend it and formalize it, we're going to say that in uh, accounting, all of our accounts are nodes in a graph. All our transactions are edges that join nodes in that graph. Um, and if we want to add more financial data to the system, the only thing we need to do is add more nodes and more edges to the graph. It's a fully immutable data set. You can just keep drawing edges to expand the, the data set. So here's a more complicated example. Uh, how much do I have in inventory and how much do I have in cash is supplemented by a third account now, which is how, what is my revenue? So, or in this case, maybe you could think of it as profit. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Um, so here we're going to say there's actually uh, $20 in inventory uh, that we lost, but in exchange we got $35. It has to balance, so you have to explain that extra uh, $15. And that's explained by actually making money. So that's the balancing part of this journal entry. Uh, it's, think of it like this. If you want to think of it like as a, as a data model, um, double entry accounting is a way for you to create a state machine that, uh, for every single penny that's in the, in the system. So all 3,500 pennies had to transition from some state called in inventory or in revenue into cash. So there's this sort of like bulk transition operation going on here. And so, right, these, uh, you can keep adding more journal entries that reflect more payments being taken. So here's another payment, slightly different amounts of money. Um, and what's kind of convenient about these is that not only do they commute, like I can actually take, it's actually a valid journal entry if I had both of those first, I'm gonna take just these look first two. These first two commute, like you could like sum them together, you could break them apart, you could add more detail, but the point is that they're still, uh, they're, they commute and they still have the same sort of behavior ultimately. And here's another journal entry, but this one's kind of a refund, a kind of an undoing of that previous journal entry where the numbers are slightly different, but the point is the same, you know, we're reducing, we're, getting, we're refunding $15 in inventory and exchange. Uh, we've lost $20 in revenue and now we have $35 less in cash. So yeah, just drawing this all the way through. Every time we want to do a new journal entry in double entry accounting, we just add more edges and we add more nodes. Um, the fact that this data set is immutable is going to be super, super useful. So accounting at Square. Um, like I was saying, we uh, started something very simple, you know, the little card readers were swiping payments. And we had a card payments table. It was very cute. It had like a column for the amount of money that we was, were charging, and then another column for the amount of fees that we were taking, because we charge a fee. Um, and then we also had to have a table for, you know, like when we actually send people money at the end of the day, we're swiping people's credit cards, or merchants are swiping people's credit cards, and then we have to send the merchant the money for that. And then we had like a couple more features. <laughs> um, and so really got here very fast. Um, and about like a year ago, we just were like, we can't do this anymore. <laughs> this is not sustainable. Um, we really have no capacity to expand what our um, settlement system can do. And our settlement system is actually really similar to the order processor that um, the Uber team was talking about. Um, we really couldn't expand the system's like, logic anymore after a, a period of time. And so we, we were like, what are we going to do? We decided we wanted to go, and by this point, we had learned that we were like, oh, double entry accounting, what were we thinking? So we were like, how do we make the system that gets us what we need uh, to uh, really um, uh, redo like, how Square builds out its settlement system and then expand it so that we can build new products because we want to build new cool things? So uh, here's some core features we wanted in a new kind of base layer for our double entry data. One, we wanted something that could handle graphical data. So I'll talk a little bit about graph scaling. That's sort of a challenge, and if you're not familiar with having to shard a database, it'll make more sense once we go into that. The second thing is we wanted multi-tenancy. So um, there are multiple products at Square. You know, you might know us for like the Cash app. You might know us about for Caviar. There's a couple other systems that we have. And each one kind of has its own accounting database. So we wanted to just solve this problem once and for all. Everyone kind of needs to store accounting data. Let's just make the best one possible. And then it get multi-tenant so that other teams at Square can use it. And the third thing is we wanted to make the most secure accounting ledger service in the world. So we, I'm loath to say the word blockchain. 
But we did look at blockchain technology and cryptographic primitives to uh, apply to double entry accounting. And so now I'm very proud of what we've built. It's, it's a fully tamper proof accounting service. And we're going to talk a little bit about the crypto in it. Uh, right. And so here's, there it is. It's called Books. Books is great. Um, uh, it is an accounting ledger as a service, and it has some pretty great scalability properties. Uh, it is tamper-proof, and uh, it has now at least one tenant and, and a second one coming online very soon. Okay, graph scaling. So if you haven't had to shard a database, uh, congratulations. Um, it, it's very painful, uh, and depending on the, the shape of your data. So here's a simple example of, no, of pretty easy to shard data. Imagine you just have distinct users, and you never do anything but write data to those particular users' data. So those arrows are like writes coming in. If you only ever write to those users and never to anyone else at the same time, it's pretty easy to partition your data. You just create some hashing mechanism or a lookup mechanism for saying, OK, user A, you're on server one. User B, you're on server two, et cetera. And writes just go to that partition. You don't need to worry about much else beyond that. Um, but for accounting data, uh, it's a little bit different. Again, picture the Cash App, and, and also this is not unique to accounting data. It's also true for like you know Facebook and social networks. You have operations that cross over your data partitions, and you end up with this nasty problem where if you try to partition your data set, you end up with an impossibly there's just, there's no way to partition the data. The graph is fully connected. So um, accounting data looks like that. Um, Nobody, nobody wants your two-phase commit implementation. Sorry. I know you think you're, you're cute, but it's not going to happen. I mean, and accounting data is even worse because accounting transactions can actually have more than two entries. Like you can have, like we saw in the previous example with three, there can be quite a few, there can be quite a few entries that go into that journal entry. So uh, it's pretty hard to find a split in your data that makes, your, makes it scalable. So we paid money to solve this problem. We decided to be Square's first online system using Google Cloud Spanner, which is wonderful because it kind of solves at least the sort of consistency operation of like how do I get an, like a transaction that can span uh, partitions. Of course, we've you know there's still a performance cost. Like as a rule, and here's my if we want to talk about Kubernetes and also Cloud Spanner after this during the break, I'm happy to talk about that. Super interesting learnings, um, but. All your, all your sharding problems just become performance problems, so you have to like, learn how to write your data in the same way. Um, so we're also using Kubernetes, really like it, very powerful, um, really lets us use the cloud, and it's pretty great. Um, and uh, all the things that we've learned from building out a payments processing company, all the lessons that we've learned about scaling our data set, um, we've applied to building the service. All right, so here's the fun bit, the tamper-proofing, the cryptographic properties of the system. So let's pretend this is your service on the left. This is you, you realize that actually you are tracking financial state. You're doing anything involving money, so therefore you need to be doing double-entry accounting. Um, and you want to use books as the service to store your data. So your service comes with, will have a key that is a private key that you use to sign transactions that you send to us. Uh, when you send the uh, journal entry, to the book service, you sign that journal entry. So remember the journal entry being the like, new edges we're drawing in the graph. Uh, you sign that journal entry with your own key, but that's not enough. So part of the problem with that is, imagine I'm a malicious person, and I go to an ATM, and I also have control of books. I say, OK, I want $300, please. And the ATM happily emits $300. The transaction gets recorded, minus $300 in my book, in, on, in books. But if I'm the attacker, I can just say, aha, I know you signed that journal entry, but I can also just go delete it. There's nothing stopping me from deleting it and then reissuing that same $300 withdrawal. I mean, I could just take as much money as I wanted. So we wanted a system that also made it possible for us to detect when journal entries have been removed from the system, too. And this was substantially more complicated. So the way this works is books also issues a one-time use key. Uh, through something called a seekable, a seekable sequential key generator. Uh, it's sort of like, imagine like a pseudo-random number generator with a fixed seed, and, uh, but that every time you use it, it generates a key. And that, you can't reverse the key going back. So books will actually issue this key, um, sign the journal entry, store that second signature, and then toss the key that it just used. So unless you have the root key, there's no way for you to go back and sort of rewrite history, because the key is gone. The root key is stored kind of with our hardware security module in a very safe place. And so you can't just go back and reissue this uh, journal entry. 
So that just means it's impossible for us in Square engineers or anyone to go in and create and reorder or destroy transactions without having some detection happen. Like we can detect that there's things missing from the sequence. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. And this is something that we've applied. Uh, that immutable model, the fact that we can keep adding entries, it means that like, we can know when anything has been deleted, too. So there's, this was a really powerful addition. And I think we might be the first double entry accounting service in the world that also has this cryptographic security property, which is cool. So some applications. Um, this is kind of the end of the talk. But basically, yeah, the entire system that we had for managing payments processing, for managing um, kind of the more complicated payments processing uh, products that we're now planning to offer or already offer are now built on top of this double entry system. Double entry accounting is super expressive, and it's let us really do some pretty powerful stuff. Um, fees and fee management is also something that's going on here. And again, because it's multi-tenant, you know, in addition to services being able to use it at Square, um, it's, you know, we're figuring out how we can make this uh, something that people outside of Square can leverage a little bit more effectively too. So uh, that's kind of it. Again, yeah, like, if you want to talk about this after, uh, afterwards during the break, uh, come up to any one of us and um, yeah, have a talk about it. Thanks a lot.